All right, in these next few videos, we're gonna get into the senses of taste and smell and also some multi-sensory interactions that uh, relate to both of those. So for this first one, we'll start with gustation, which is the formal term for the sense of taste. Now, taste and smell often come together or come up together because they're both chemical senses, meaning the way they work is by sensory receptors being directly stimulated by molecules. So in some general sense, the, the role or function of both of these senses is pretty, pretty primary. They serve as gatekeepers of the body. They help us identify things that should be consumed to survive, while also detecting things that you know would be harmful and should be rejected or avoided. And they create positive and negative affective responses, meaning emotional responses, including things like our enjoyment of eating, which keeps us doing it and staying alive. Now, in both of these senses, the sensory receptor neurons that detect molecules, they're replaced very quickly. Like all of your taste receptors are replaced every one or two weeks. The smell receptors up inside your nose, they're replaced every five or seven weeks. This is very different from our other senses, but that's because taste and smell have such direct contact with the world by directly picking up molecules from out there. That's, that's pretty different from our other senses that we've talked about. Like the rods and cones for vision are detecting light, and light is something that doesn't have any mass at all. So no matter is making contact with your rods and cones. And with audition, our sense of hearing, the neurons in the cochlea, they're getting sloshed around in a wave pattern that corresponds to some wave that's out there in the air, but no piece of the world out there is coming in and touching the cochlea directly. Now the sense of touch is a little more direct, right? Since it usually involves some piece of the world making direct contact with our body, but even then it's usually just deforming or vibrating the outer skin and the mechanoreceptors in there, they detect that indirectly. But here with taste and smell, a piece of the world actually comes in direct contact with our sensory neurons. That means those sensory neurons also get exposed to dirt, to bacteria, to all sorts of things, hence why they're replaced very quickly. Now for this video, we're gonna concentrate on taste. Now, you might think of taste as something with near infinite variety, right? All the different food dishes that you've enjoyed or, or not enjoyed across your lifetime, all the different spices and herbs and different ways of preparing a meal. And yet, it turns out taste is a very, very limited sense. What you're probably thinking of when you think back to an amazing meal or what you experienced during that, fir during, like, that first bite of ice cream, that perceptual experience you're having is, is what we call flavor, not the sense of taste. We'll come back and talk about flavor soon and see that it's made up of much more than just taste. But when it comes to the actual sense of taste, we literally can only detect five things, five basic qualities. We can detect how salty something is. That helps us ensure we get enough of the sodium that's needed for bodily functions. Indeed, we like naturally seek it out and get more enjoyment out of it after sweating when the body needs it most. We can also directly detect sweetness, meaning we detect you know molecular sugars. Functionally, sweetness is a good signal of caloric value. So there's survival right there, right? Long before we added a bunch of sugar to processed foods, long before we even as humans developed agriculture, it was really important for us as, as a species to identify sources rich in calories. Like for most of our evolutionary history, starvation was a much bigger issue than overeating. So we evolved to seek out sugar, to enjoy it. It naturally elicits an automatic acceptance or approach response, unlike the, the next couple taste qualities we'll talk about. And indeed, when your taste receptors detect sweetness, they actually initiate an anticipatory metabolic response. You actually start digestion before the food even leaves your mouth. Uh, in fact, Ivan Pavlov showed this sort of response by putting food in a dog's mouth, but then blocking the food from being swallowed. And even without any swallowing, without any absorbing of nutrients, he found gastric and uh, pancreatic enzyme production, basically the body preparing to digest the calories as soon as that's in the mouth. Okay, then there are a couple taste qualities we can detect that are more about avoidance than approach, at least from their uh, evolutionary function. They're more about what not to eat than what to eat. So one would be sour. But we basically have the ability to detect acidity, like how acidic something is. From an evolutionary perspective, this is a really important function because it helps us identify spoiled food, something that can make you sick, potentially even kill you. And then there's bitter, another taste quality that we generally evolve to minimize or avoid. 
Functionally, it helps detect poisons or toxins. Now, some plants have, have evolved to, to cause like a bitter response in order to sort of protect the plant from predation. But uh, in general, the idea is this is our best way of detecting something that might make us sick. It naturally causes an, an auto-rejection response, meaning your body doesn't want to swallow it. It naturally starts to reject when it detects bitterness. Of course, through learning and conditioning, we can certainly overcome that, and many people learn to enjoy some bitterness, like with hoppy beers or black coffee, but as we'll see, the people who enjoy bitter, fi bitter foods uh, more may actually have a genetic propensity to, to just not detect bitter as much, to not experience as much bitterness as others who don't enjoy those foods as much. Now, those four are the most well-known taste qualities, but in the 1980s, scientists actually confirmed a fifth distinct taste quality. All the way back in 1908, there was a Japanese chemist who had used the word umami to describe a, a pleasant, savory kind of taste. You can think of umami as the taste quality that makes things uh, savory or meaty. Um, the most straightforward way to set off our umami detectors is MSG, monosodium glutamate. Functionally, it's, it's thought that we evolved to detect umami as a way to help us detect protein, basically, to make sure we get enough protein. Now, specifically, what umami is detecting is glutamic acid, which is an amino acid. It, it helps the body synthesize proteins and make the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, a really important neurotransmitter we need for neural signaling like all throughout our body. So we need this stuff for some very basic bodily processes, and it makes sense we'd evolve a way to detect it, to make sure we get enough of it. So if you can't detect something, it's hard to ensure you're getting you know, the amount you need to survive. Now, FYI, uh, taste signals are not perfect indicators. So for example, some poisonous mushrooms taste good, right? And some bitter foods are totally safe, even healthy, like vegetables, right? And some things set off our sweetness detectors. In other words, we experience the taste quality of sweetness for some chemicals that don't actually have any caloric value, like sucralose and saccharin and other artificial sweeteners or non-caloric sweeteners. Which, by the way, sucralose, which is now marketed as, as Splenda, it was discovered when a researcher misheard the command to test a chemical, T-E-S-T, -E to test a chemical, and thought the request was to taste the chemical. And because of that mishearing, they tried it out. Turned out it was really sweet. And that led to, oh, we can, we can market this thing, you know, test it and eventually market it. In fact, Sweet and Low was found by accident, um, in a similar way when a graduate student was working on a fever drug in a laboratory and went on smoke break and accidentally tasted something sweet on his finger. And was like, huh, what's this? And then went and figured out what was going on. Saccharin was found by accident in the late 1890s by a researcher who forgot to wash his hands at lunch, just kind of tasted something sweet, and was like, I need to go back to, you know, taste everything in my laboratory until I find the culprit. But basically, these calorie-free sweeteners, they're just molecules that are similar enough to the shape of, of actual sugars to set off those sweetness detecting neurons that we've evolved. It makes us perceive sweetness because the sweetness detector neurons are firing. It's sort of a taste illusion, if you will. Also, we can learn to enjoy or learn to stop enjoying certain combinations of taste qualities. So just because each of the taste qualities seems to have a you know certain evolutionary function doesn't mean we won't ever eat sour or bitter or enjoy those things. Like there are also um, common developmental differences. So for example, children tend to enjoy sour way more than adults do. So there are some, some subtleties here when it comes to the functions of those taste qualities, but basically our detectors are made for just picking up those five taste qualities. By the way, other animals, even other mammals like us, don't necessarily have the same set of basic taste qualities that we are able to detect. So for example, cats cannot taste sweetness, like sweet water versus plain water tastes the same to them. Now rats, on the other hand, they can definitely taste sweet. Indeed, sweet water is used as a conditioned stimulus in a bunch of behavioral neuroscience studies, like looking at things like drug use. But rats can also detect something we can't, a taste quality we can't detect, which is starch. Uh, 
and lots of carnivores like hyenas, dolphins, sea lions, and stuff, they seem to taste only saltiness, not other taste qualities. And if you think about it, it makes some sense. Carnivores don't really need, uh, you know, sugar from sweet fruits. They don't need to avoid bitter plants when they're choosing what plants to eat. They don't have as many choices to make as herbivores and omnivores that need to be able to distinguish safe from unsafe plants. And then there's examples like, you know, panda bears. They have a really weird ass diet. They've lost the ability to taste umami because they primarily eat bamboo now. So those are just some examples. Now, how do we actually detect those five basic taste qualities? Like what are the sensory receptors for taste? So obviously this is going to be in the mouth. And in fact, it's going to be on our tongue that we have the receptors that pick up taste qualities. But how does this work? Well, if you look closely at someone's tongue, like kind of zoom in a little, you don't even need a microscope for this, but just looking closely at a tongue, you'll see a lot of little bumps on it. Across much of the tongue surface, we have a variety of, of what are called papillae, which just means a, a little rounded protuberance sticking out. There, there are four types. You can see them labeled on this image here called uh, fungiform papillae, filiform papillae, foliate papillae, and in the back of the tongue there, circumvallate papillae. Now, most of those, most papillae, if you zoom in, they have taste buds on them. So just looking at an example here in the image, we've got a fungiform papilla, and at the top of it, you can see the little thing sticking out in purple. That is a taste bud. So I'm sure you've heard of taste buds before, but that's what we're talking about. We've got about 10,000 total taste buds across the tongue, although that number gets quite a bit smaller as we age. Someone who's you know really old might have 5,000 or so. Now, note that the, the filiform papillae, they actually don't have taste buds on them. So of the four types, one of them doesn't have taste buds. They have a different function we'll come back to. But for most papillae, what, the, what they're there for, basically, or one of the main things is to hold those taste buds. And in each taste bud, if you zoom in on a taste bud, there are a bunch of neurons. Basically, that's most of what's in a taste bud is just a bunch of these neurons. There are about 50 to 100 of them. These are the actual sensory receptors for taste. These are the neurons that pick up some molecules and turn it into neurons firing. So we call these taste receptor cells. Makes sense. They're a sensory receptor, right? They're a sensory receptor neuron, and they're for taste. So we just call them taste receptor cells, TRCs. These are the actual sensory neurons for taste, the thing that accomplishes transduction for this sense. Uh, there's an open pore at the top where the, the molecules can basically touch the tips of these taste receptor cells. So at the top of the taste bud, there's a little opening where all these 50 or 100 little cells have a little thing at the tip that, that sticks out that can actually make contact with the molecules in our mouth that are on our tongue. So the tips of those cells, if you zoom in, zoom in on the little tip that's, that's you know sticking out of the taste pore there, they have receptors on them. Like we've talked about before with neurons in general, it's a kind of lock and key situation. So if the right shape of molecule lands into the receptor, it opens an ion channel. And that's what makes the neuron fire, right? It changes the, the electrical charge inside the neuron if you open that up. So it starts a process that eventually makes the neuron fire. So at the tips of those taste receptor cells, we've got detectors for molecules that correspond to all of those taste qualities we've talked about before. Now, just a side note, I mentioned the, the filiform papillae. They don't have taste buds. So one of those types of papillae don't. That's kind of weird since unlike the others, they're, they're actually found all over the tongue. The function of these little guys, the filiform ones, is just to help increase the surface area of the tongue and, and add more contact and friction kind of for, for food on the tongue, kind of helps you position food for chewing and swallowing. So they just have a different role than the other papillae, which have taste buds on them. But the ones we care about will be the other three that, that do have taste buds on them, because that's where the taste receptor cells are. And that's how we start some neurons firing to send a signal to the brain to say, hey, I detected some sweet or some salt or some umami. Now, if you look closely at someone's tongue, even with the naked eye, you can see the papillae. Like that's the red dots at the front of the tongue here and along the sides. Those are fungiform papillae. Uh, the foliate papillae, they're more along the sides and towards the back on the sides. And the circumvallate ones we, we saw before, they're at the very back. And, and in their taste buds, if you zoom in, right, there are a lot of taste receptor cells. So in the, the ones at the back, the circumvallate ones, for example, they're really sensitive to bitter. Um, now, you may have seen a diagram like this one on the left here. A, it's called a tongue map. 
which claims that we can only taste sweetness at the front of the tongue, or only taste bitterness at the back of the tongue, or sour and salty along the sides, and so on. This is actually a myth, a common myth, that comes from a psychologist a long time ago that mistranslated a German paper from back in like 1901. In fact, what the original paper had found was not that you know sweetness is only detected at the tip of the tongue, but that there were tiny differences in the absolute threshold of different taste qualities at each of those locations. So you can detect a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of sweet a little more easily at the tip of the tongue, for example, than other places. But if you put like any normal amount of sugar on any part of the tongue with taste buds, you experience the exact same intensity of sweetness. So it doesn't really change much. The, the tip doesn't experience sweetness more strongly or anything. It's just slightly better at detecting minuscule amounts when it comes to the absolute threshold. But all the taste qualities are detected all across the parts of the tongue that have taste buds, as you can see on the diagram on the right here. So whether it's bitter or salty or umami or whatever, you can detect it at the front of the tongue, the back of the tongue, the sides of the tongue. Now, if you want to try a really cool taste experiment at home, there's a natural kind of sugar-free sweetener of sorts that you can buy on Amazon called Miracle Berries. Uh, Imberry is one, one um, brand of this that you can buy this. But basically, you buy it as a little tablet that dissolves on your tongue. It's actually made from the, the plant uh, Sincepalum dulcificum, which uh, has a compound called miraculin. So for a long time in, in West Africa, people have chewed on the fruit to make like stale and sour bread taste better. And you'll understand why in a minute. But nowadays, you'll usually hear people talking about miracle berries in the context of flavor tripping parties. Basically, bring people over for a party, grab a bunch of food. Everyone dissolves one of these tablets on their tongue. Again, it's just made out of a, a berry, a fruit. Dissolve one of these tablets on their tongue. It takes about 10 minutes. You just move it around to different parts of the tongue. So it gets lots of the taste buds covered. Now, the compound itself does not taste sweet. This is not an artificial sweetener like sucralose. Like the little berry when you're moving it around on your tongue or the little tablet doesn't actually taste sweet. You're not setting off your sweetness detectors at this point. But what you do after dissolving it is then you try various foods. And what you'll find is some foods magically taste really sweet, foods you wouldn't normally expect. I've actually done a lot of these food tripping parties with friends. It's pretty fun. Like Guinness, the beer Guinness tastes like a milkshake. Uh, lemon juice, just drinking straight lemon juice tastes like lemonade or lime juice tastes like limeade. Uh, yellow mustard just tastes like honey mustard. Blue cheese is kind of sweet. Salt and vinegar chips taste sweet. It's, it's kind of weird. So what's going on here? Well, that compound, the miraculin that's in the berries, it actually binds to the sweet receptors on our taste receptor cells, but, but not quite well enough to open the ion channels up. So it's like a key that doesn't quite open the lock, but it can fit part way in. It can get into the lock. It just can't turn and, and open the lock. But that's when your mouth is at a, a neutral pH level, sort of a normal balance between acid and base. The miraculin is just sitting there doing nothing to the sweetness receptors that it's sitting at. But when acid is added to your mouth, when the pH in your mouth changes because you've got some acid in your mouth, like from sour food, the molecule, the miraculin molecule, changes conformation. It actually changes shape and now is able to activate the sweetness receptors to actually unlock those, open up the ion channels and make the sweet detecting neuron fire a signal to the brain. So acid, meaning like sour foods, activates the sweet receptors if you've had one of these tablets in your mouth and we perceive sweetness, we experience it as sweetness without any sugar actually being there. It's a fun little taste experiment you can try at home, uh, although each tablet runs about a $1.50 or so if you buy a bunch of them. So you wouldn't use it every day to make your black coffee taste sweeter or anything like that, although people have explored uh, putting it as like a food additive. Um, okay, getting back to the, to the science here. Now, now taste sensations, they get transduced at the, the taste receptor cells and the taste buds of the tongue, right? But where does that signal go from there? It, it actually, it has to get to the brain, right? So it actually goes out some cranial nerves, just goes out a bundle of nerves, kind of like before we had the optic nerve coming out of the eyes. Um, there's a nerve coming out of the cochlea, right? All these things. But here we've got a, a couple different cranial nerves that comes out, but it goes through the brain stem, 
that's that thing at the very back of our brain, kind of the bottom of the brain where it, where it um, fuses with the spinal cord. So it goes out the cranial nerves, passes through the brainstem, but then the first important stop for our purposes is that it goes through, drum roll, the freaking thalamus, right? Because that familiar old sensory gateway just has to have its fingers in just about everything. It, it, our senses pass through the thalamus. But just like vision and audition and somato sensation, just like our other senses we've talked about, once it passes through the thalamus, it ends up in the cerebral cortex, in a, a specialized area of the cerebral cortex that's dedicated to the initial processing for that sense. So with vision, we had V1. With audition, we had A1. With somato sensation, we had S1. And now for gustation, the sense of taste, we have G1, which stands for the primary gustatory cortex. You can think of it as being in the frontal lobe. Like if you were to ask, which of the four lobes is our, our taste area in? I would say the frontal lobe. That's actually easy to remember because the, the mouth is at the front of the head. So that's where the frontal lobe processing that kind of just makes sense. Now, if I was to be a little more specific, it's at the very back of the frontal lobe where it touches an area called the insula. Now, we haven't discussed the insula much, but it's sometimes called the, the fifth lobe of the cortex. It's just kind of tucked in behind and underneath the frontal lobe, kind of closer to the center of the head. So I'll show you a, a picture of that. Here's an image of the brain just labeling a, a lot of places we've already talked about. So let's start at the back of the brain. On the right here, the back of the brain, the occipital lobe is shown in green with the primary visual cortex, V1. It's at the far back in dark green. And then you can go to the, the parietal lobe in blue there, right at the top of the brain, with the dark blue strip at the front, that is S1, primary somatosensory cortex. In the temporal lobe, you can see they've highlighted uh, A1 in pure yellow, right? It's kind of near the middle there, but that's still part of the temporal lobe at the top. That in yellow, that's the A1, primary auditory cortex. And nearby, what they show in orange, that's kind of the auditory support area for, for a little additional auditory processing. And we've seen the, the motor parts of the cortex, right? For making our motor actions, making movement in the world. That's part of the frontal cortex, kind of at the back, what's seen in red here at the back of the frontal lobe. That is M1, the primary motor cortex. And those kind of peach areas in front of it, those are motor related areas for planning and prepping motor actions. If you go all the way to the front of the frontal lobe, we haven't talked about this much in this class, but you may recognize the prefrontal cortex. It's an area known to be involved in a lot of things like self-control and planning and synthesizing information across time. So some of those higher level thinking functions. But now in this diagram, you can see them. They've kind of used a tool here to pry open. We wouldn't do this much in a living brain unless we had to do some surgery, but they've kind of pried open where the temporal and frontal lobes meet. And you can see there's an area of more cortex, additional cerebral cortex that's tucked just underneath there, a bit deeper into the brain, towards the middle of the brain. That includes the insula, the, the kind of hidden fifth lobe I mentioned, the hidden fifth lobe of the brain. And then now we can say, okay, where is the gustatory cortex? Where's G1? Well, they've marked it in purple here, the primary gustatory cortex, G1. You can see it overlaps the frontal lobe, like it is part of the frontal lobe, but also it goes across the insula. It's part of the insula. And for now, we won't worry about smell, but that's what the, you know, the little pink area here that they show, that's part of smell processing. What they've labeled olfactory cortex, we'll see it's a little more complicated. But the point is, if you just want to think of where does gustatory or taste information go in the brain, it's that purple area. Um, you know, the easiest way to think of it is its frontal lobe, but you can see kind of it actually hits this, this extra area underneath as well. Now, speaking of the neural basis of taste, we could ask a question similar to what we asked with previous senses. How is taste information encoded in the brain? Like how are tastes represented by the pew, 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 pew of neurons firing? In other words, we're kind of asking like, does taste utilize specificity coding where an individual neuron fires to signal a particular taste quality? Or does it use some form of population coding where a particular pattern of firing across many neurons, or maybe even just a sparse set of, of multiple neurons, where that pattern is what leads to a particular taste quality? Now, 
I don't want us to get too lost in the details here, but I'm just going to give you some evidence from some studies that seem to support either or, or both of these positions. And we'll see, we'll kind of come to a conclusion that probably both types of coding are used. Although I'd say taste leans a little more towards specificity coding, at least in early process. Okay, so first off, is there evidence of specificity coding in the taste system? So uh, Mueller and colleagues in 2005, they showed, for example, that normal mice can't detect, there's a, a bitter substance called PTC. It's a chemical that humans find quite bitter, uh, but, but normal mice, healthy mice, cannot detect it. You put it in their mouth, they don't have any response to it. That's the blue line here on the graph to the right. So if you look at the graph, the x-axis at the bottom, that's showing how much of this chemical, the PTC chemical, is there. And you can see, regardless of how much we put there, a little bit or a lot of it, it doesn't have any effect on the mouse's behavior. So on the y-axis, we have their licking behavior. There's no change with a bunch of PTC put in their mouth. Now, for us humans, the stuff tastes bitter as hell. Like, we change our behavior. You put that in someone's mouth, and they will change their behavior a lot. The mice don't. That suggests they're not actually perceiving it. They're not registering it. They don't have the ability to detect it. But then in this study, what they did is they genetically engineered mice to have the human gene for PTC receptors. So we take the human gene and we splice it into the mouse genome. And the, these mice, the ones in the lab in this experimental group, they now have PTC receptors. So basically the gene expresses, creates the protein that creates the, the, the PTC receptors develop on these, mice's, on these mice uh, on their tongues. So suddenly those mice, they avoid PTC. As you can see from the red line here, the more PTC of this kind of bitter substance you put in their mouth, now they're detecting it and their behavior is changing, showing you they are perceiving it, they're experiencing it. So that's the first part of this study. Now the second part of this study, there's a different bitter compound called 6, C-Y-X. And mice naturally avoid this because they already, just normal, healthy, standard mice, they already have a receptor to detect this bitter substance. So in the study, what they did is they genetically engineered mice to no longer have that receptor, to take out the 6 receptor. And the mice stopped avoiding 6. Like you put that in their mouth and they didn't act like it was bitter. Basically, it tells us they no longer tasted its bitterness. And, in fact, 6 no longer caused any neural firing in the pathway to the brain. It was no longer being registered in the communication signals that go to the brain, which is, of course, why then there would be no behavioral change. So what we find from a study like this, this is just one example of many such studies, but what we find is adding or removing a single specific receptor seems to affect both the neural firing and the animal's behavior. In other words, what they perceive and experience, what they taste. So that seems to suggest specificity coding, a single receptor dictating whether a neuron fires and thus whether we experience that taste, whether we have a bitter experience, right? But that was kind of specificity coding evidence. What about uh, population coding? Because other research, it turns out, does seem to point towards maybe more of a population type of coding for taste, or at least a sparse population type of coding. So for example, um, there was an old study that Erickson did back in 1963, uh, where they measured a bunch of individual neurons in the, the, the cranial nerves of a rat. So basically what's coming out of the tongue. Um, and they presented three different substances on the tongue while they were measuring these neurons to see when will these neurons fire. So in the graph here, if you look at the x-axis of the graph, it's just showing 13 different neurons. These are neurons that are coming out of the tongue. In other words, neurons that are coming out of those taste receptor cells and going toward the brain to pass the signal along. So they've just randomly picked 13 different neurons there, and they're measuring that firing. They're, they're graphing each neuron's activity when a particular substance was put on the tongue. So the red line here is one substance. It's ammonium chloride. You put that on the tongue, and you see this particular pattern of firing across those 13 neurons that they happen to be recording from. So like for the red line here, when you put ammonium chloride on the tongue, what you see is lots of firing in A and B, but not so much firing in H, I, J, K, L, M, right? Now the green line here, that's measuring those same 13 neurons coming out of the tongue toward the brain, seeing how they're behaving when we put a different chemical, uh, potassium chloride, on the tongue. 
And you can see for the green line, it's a pretty similar pattern of responding overall. A few little differences, but overall similar. Now look at the last data set here, which is the, the open circles where there's no line drawn in. That's when they put a different substance, sodium chloride, on the tongue. You get a totally different pattern of firing across those 13 neurons, right? Pretty different from the other two, very different pattern. Now here, there's not an individual neuron that specifies ammonium chloride, like that only turns on for ammonium chloride and doesn't turn on for anything else. There's no individual neuron that specifies sodium chloride. So it's not, doesn't seem to be specificity coding. Rather, we've got distinct patterns across a set of multiple neurons. But the big question then is, do these patterns correspond to what's actually perceived? Are they encoding the things, the taste qualities that we are actually going to perceive or experience, or in this case, that the animal is going to experience? So Erickson actually used classical conditioning to pair up one of the substances with shocking the rat. So one of those substances started to predict that the rat was about to be shocked. Basically, the rat learned to associate the taste of one of those three chemicals with getting shocked. So you're going to kind of hate that taste, right? But then Erickson gave them the choice between ammonium chloride or sodium chloride. Like if they'd made them hate potassium chloride, then he gave them the choice. Here's, you know, two drinks you can have, one with ammonium chloride in it, one with sodium chloride in it. Which one do you prefer? Now, if they perceive the taste of potassium chloride and say ammonium chloride as being similar, if the perceptual experience is similar, then they're going to avoid ammonium chloride, right? Because that will help them avoid shocks. And sure enough, that's what, that's what happened. That's what they found. Uh, likewise, if in a different um, version of the experiment, if he had shocked them when they were drinking ammonium chloride, then in the follow-up test, they would avoid potassium chloride, but they wouldn't avoid sodium chloride. So basically the substances, the chemicals that had, had similar patterns of neural firing across a set of neurons seem to correspond to similar uh, perceptual experiences of taste. Basically, the mouse clearly, or rat, or, or mouse, I forget which, uh, clearly experienced these two chemicals similarly, right? Because it, it said one is very similar to the thing that shocked me, and the, uh, and the sodium chloride isn't. But that corresponds with the neural firing across a bunch of neurons, a pattern across a bunch of neurons. So we could say taste was being represented or encoded by those patterns of firing, not by an individual receptor or an individual neuron, patterns of firing across neural populations seem to encode taste in a study like this, which means now we've got some evidence that taste uses specificity coding, but also some evidence here that it uses population coding, or at least sparse coding, right? Like a small population of neurons. You know, we're looking at 13 here, but it might be a, a small percentage of the neurons or something like that. Now, indeed, there, there's another study that, that came out in, um, I think, 1999 that, that came to the same basic conclusion of, of this kind of mixed results. So there they measured the, the firing of individual neurons going from the tongue to the brain, just going via those cranial nerves heading out toward the brain. Uh, in other words, what they're doing, they're hooking up an electrode to an individual neuron, leaving the tongue, and, and then seeing what makes that neuron that they're measuring fire. They're, they're basically mapping out the receptive field of the neurons that go from the tongue to the brain, just like we mapped the receptive field of neurons that go from like the ganglion cell in our eye through the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus on their way to V1 for vision. Here they're mapping out the receptive field of the neurons that are going from the taste receptor cells on the tongue towards G1 in the brain. So they just pick some neurons that are kind of passing the signal along partway through this process. They're hooking up to them and saying, when do these neurons fire for an individual neuron? So here what you're going to see, like at the top of this graph, that's one individual neuron. So in some neurons they measured, they found a very specific firing pattern. For example, as we can see in panel A, at the top of the image here, this is all panel A, they presented different chemicals to the tongue while measuring this one neuron. So they presented either sucrose, that's a, a sweet substance, or NaCl, sodium chloride, that's table salt, uh, so that'd be a salty substance, uh, or HCl, hydrochloric acid, which is an acidic substance, sour basically, uh, or QHCl, quanine hydrochloride, which is, which is bitter. 
Um, so basically, they presented these four substances to the tongue, a sweet, salty, uh, sour, or bitter substance to the tongue. And then they were measuring this one particular neuron. And what happened, they just happened here, the one they were measuring, just happened to find a neuron that fired if and only if sucrose was on the tongue, if sweetness was on the tongue. It seemed to be a sucrose selective neuron or a sweetness selective neuron. Like its receptive field was sucrose hitting the taste bud that its axon came from. Meanwhile, they found other neurons, like in panel B here, other neurons that were selective to salt, but that didn't fire for the other taste qualities. For substances, we you know relate to those other taste qualities. So some neurons seem to be using specificity coding, like the types that we see in panel A and panel B here. But in that same study, they also found other neurons, again, going um, in the cranial nerves, like going out from the tongue toward the brain, they found some that were less specific, like ones that might respond to salty or to sour or to bitter. All of those things would make this, this one neuron go off, but not much to sweet or other patterns like that that were kind of mixes of these things. So that is not specificity coding, right? They found kind of a mix of both. Now, again, I don't want to go too deep into this stuff. So for now, I'll just say the conclusion we could take away is that taste probably uses a combination of specificity coding and population coding. Um, from, from the literature in general, kind of the, the state of the literature right now, the best quick summary would be that the taste receptor cells in the taste buds, like the very earliest part of processing, those taste receptor cells seem to be pretty specific, only firing for a particular taste quality. But then later in the process, some of the neurons heading out to the brain, they might start to use a little more population coding, um, you know, kind of like, or sparse coding at least, right? Although some of them, many of them do still retain that specificity coding as well. So you might say the, those five basic taste qualities, they come from some specificity coding, and then uh, population coding maybe helps distinguish subtle taste differences or patterns within categories. Um, okay, let's move on. Now, just like our other senses, we can lose the sense of taste. The term for loss of taste is agusia. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's kind of a, a weird word, but just to help you remember and recognize it, you might note that after the initial a prefix at the start, which stands for lack of, right, lack of something, after that a, the next letter is g. So it's associated with gustation, the sense of taste, just like we had G1 for the primary gustatory cortex. That will help you remember agusia is loss of taste. Now, there's also a, a partial loss of taste. Like if you just have a change, you don't, you don't taste things quite as much. That's called hypogusia. In, in either case, there are lots of possible causes, lots of things that can cause this. So just for example, um, it can come from neurological damage, like that would be, you know, multiple sclerosis can do this, Bell's palsy, uh, meningitis, or other viruses. Um, from endocrine problems like Cushing's disease, or I don't know, diabetes mellitus, or diabetes mellitus, uh, or um, like vitamin B deficiency can cause um, taste issues. Uh, from drug side effects, this can happen with like ACE inhibitors or, uh, or anti-rheumatics. It can also happen from tobacco use. Uh, it can happen from denture use, from cancer can sometimes have the, the, the effect of loss of taste, but also some cancer treatments like radiation or chemotherapy can also cause loss of taste. Um, now, agusia is actually really commonly confused with loss of smell since taste and smell are, are pretty tightly linked, as, as we'll soon see. We'll talk more about this. So losing either one of those affects your flavor perception, your overall experience when like eating, for example. So people may not realize what's actually causing a changed experience during eating, whether it's loss of taste or loss of smell or both. But the biggest effect, kind of side effect or, or downside um, of loss of taste, is that it often leads to weight loss and malnutrition. So think about it. If sweet things stop tasting sweet and salty things stop tasting salty, the whole eating experience just becomes way more bland and unenjoyable. So we have less you know, reinforcement for the operant behavior of taking in food. Now, even for those with a perfectly healthy sense of taste, there are some individual differences in gustation. Just for example, um, genetic variants mean that some people perceive sucrose as more sweet than other people. So if a friend says they have a sweet tooth, is it because they prefer sweetness more? 
right? Just a preference thing or because they literally experience sweetness differently than you. Turns out that the latter might actually be part of it. Someone with a sweet tooth might actually be experiencing sweetness differently because of some genetic differences there. A similar thing is true for, for the other taste qualities. So for example, there are huge differences in how bitter each person finds um, bitter substances like PTC that we talked about before, or there's another one used a lot in studies called PROP, just uh, they're common sort of classically bitter taste substances for humans. So there are, there are people we uh, label non-tasters when it comes to just bitterness, like for detecting these substances. There are people we label non-tasters that don't actually find those substances bitter much at all. Like they, they say they experience no taste or very little bitter taste uh, when you put, say, PTC on their tongue. And that's about 25% of the population are non-tasters for bitterness. Now, there, there are tasters kind of middle category, which is about half the population. So this is the most common. But then when you put something like PTC or prop on the tongue, they say it tastes bitter, like nothing crazy, just definitely and clearly a bitter taste for them. And then there are super tasters. The other 25% or so of the population, they find these substances extremely bitter. Like they want to spit it out and rinse their mouth out immediately. It's very aversive and gross. And these three categories correspond to different genetic variants. It's been studied quite a bit. In fact, uh, women are more likely to be super tasters than men. It also correlates with the number of uh, fungiform papillae, those, those ones at the front of the tongue that you can see really easily. So in fact, if you Google the term super taster and scientific American, uh, th that magazine has an explanation of how you can diagnose your own taster status just with some food dye, some blue food dye, for example, and, and counting the number of fungiform papillae on your tongue, multiplying that up, and you can actually pretty accurately diagnose your super taster status. Now, super tasters tend to avoid hoppy alcohol, research has found. Uh, they prefer sweets more as children and as adults. Uh, they consume less vegetables overall. Uh, super tasters avoid cigarettes in general. They eat less soy. And sure enough, they also have the most colon polyps and colonoscopies probably because they're avoiding vegetables, right? Which are often on the bitter side, but are also healthy for your colon. Now, by the way, you may be wondering, how can we possibly compare across two different people who of them find something more bitter than the other? Like, obviously, one way is just to ask them to rate it on an arbitrary scale, like from one to 10, how bitter is this? And compare different people. And, and when we do that, we find a sort of trimodal distribution that, again, corresponds to those genetic differences. But there's just kind of three humps in the graph, three modes, three common places where they'll put it. But, of course, people might treat the scale differently. So it's not ideal to just compare those, those arbitrary numbers straight up. So one uh, psychophysical method that sensation and perception psychologists sometimes use uh, to address this, it's called cross-modal matching. Basically for a given taste, say for a given amount of PTC or prop substance, one of those bitter substances, you put it on the tongue and you ask them to compare it to another modality, another sense basically, either through self-report or even more directly through something like having them use a dial to adjust the brightness of a light or the sound that's in earphones or even a pain stimulus uh, that's, you know, added to their arm when they turn the dial up. And we can calibrate this across tons of people to find general patterns and then have this kind of alternative or additional way to compare how extreme someone finds a particular sensation at the perceptual level of experience. Like we can't ever get inside someone's mind and, and feel what they're feeling. That is just literally impossible. It's outside the realms of science. We'll only ever have behavior. So this is just another uh, behavioral measure that can, that can add to our understanding. And we find super tasters, for example, will consistently rank the bitterness of something like prop, for example, as so bitter, it's roughly uh, uh, in magnitude, it's roughly as intense as the, the brightness of the brightest light they've experienced. Whereas when you put prop on the tongue of normal tasters, they'll put it kind of roughly as extreme as the brightness of car headlights that are on low beam or roughly the intensity of like frying bacon as a smell. It's noticeable, but it's not crazy intense. Meanwhile, the, the non-tasters on average, they report it as akin to like, you know, incredibly subtle sound of like a wristwatch ticking or something like that.
Okay, by the way, if you want to test yourself directly for, for taster status, for just a few bucks, you can order a set of little paper strips that have the PTC stub substance on them. Like Amazon has a bunch of these. It's really cheap. Usually comes with like a hundred little strips of paper. So you and your friends can all try it. You just put the piece of paper on your tongue for a few moments and see how it tastes. Then you toss the strip out. Like obviously don't eat the whole tube of a hundred or anything. Uh, but PTC, so it's a phenylthiocarbamide. Um, it, it tastes super bitter, kind of uh, super bitter for some people, kind of bitter for some people, or or tasteless, depending on your genetics. And that's because there's a, a gene, the TASR38 taste receptor gene, that just has three different forms that, that alter the expression of a, it's a G protein binding for particular bitter receptors. Uh, but basically what we're talking about, it's, it's a roughly Mendelian uh, genetic trait, so a dominant genetic trait in that, that Mendel sense of genetics. And here in the, the little um, table on the left here, you can actually see the percentage of people who are non-tasters based on this kind of test across a variety of countries that they've done over the years. And you can see it kind of averages out to around 25% of people end up as non-tasters. But there are significant differences across countries. And that's likely because it's a heritable trait, right? So there will be different populations in those countries. And just a side note, by the way, these, these PTC strips... They're actually not a very sensitive test for super ta taster status. They're not the best way. The the thing I talked about earlier where you use some food dye on your tongue and count the fungiform papillae, that's actually a better test for predicting your, your taster status um, or testing with a different compound called prop. The reason we don't that the Amazon doesn't sell little paper strips with prop on it, it's just a little harder to get it stable on a, on a piece of paper for a long time like that. It takes an extra step to kind of prepare the paper strips yourself. So you can't just order them off, off of Amazon. But if you want a quick and easy version, the, the things off Amazon are, are safe. They cost $5. It's really easy. Meanwhile, if you want to do an easier taste demo at home without needing to order anything, I've got one for you. It's actually really hard for us, it turns out, to register any of the taste qualities without saliva in your mouth because saliva helps dissolve the food and get it into those taste receptor cells right at the at the top of the taste buds. So you can experience this, this limitation yourself. You just need something like uh, clean paper towels or napkins and then some food items that represent basic taste qualities. Like you might get some sugar uh, or even sugar cubes if you have any. Um, maybe some plain old table salt or even like salty crackers, other dry foods like saltines or something. Don't use any liquid for this. That defeats the purpose. But then all you do for this is pat your tongue dry with like a clean paper towel. Like pat it until your tongue is dry. Then on the dry part of your tongue, try tasting a sample like salt or sugar or some dry foods. In fact, you might even want to pinch your nose if you really want a more pure demo of taste perception. We'll, we'll talk about why you might do that soon. But you can do this for some different substances. Like, um, you know, make sure you, uh, make sure your mouth is dry each time. You'll want to kind of rinse your mouth really well with just some water between each of the trials. So if you did sugar on the last trial, you want to make sure that, that none of it's left over on your tongue before you try salty. <clears throat> if you have a partner to do this with, you could even, um, do this with your eyes closed so you don't know what they're putting on your tongue and see how quickly or easily you can try and detect. Is it sugar? Is it salt? And see how, how bad you are at that. Just make sure between each trial you rinse your mouth and then you dry your tongue again before you try a new one. What you'll find is even salty stuff, like salty crackers, like saltines, they don't taste very salty. You may have trouble detecting that if your mouth is totally dry. And likewise, applying sugar to your tongue doesn't taste very sweet when it's dry. It's kind of a fun demo you can try at home. Okay, we're going to end the taste video here so we can move on to smell for now. After a couple videos diving into smell, we'll then uh, bring taste back into the picture a little bit when we discuss multi-sensory perception and kind of how those two senses work together. So we'll have a video on flavor as a, a you know partly a, a combination between those two things.